Trust me, you can sell $10 million albums and be broke if you have greedy people behind you. All right. This is how a group can sell 10 million records and be broke. And everyone, get ready to do your math. When we first started out, we were kind of cocky. Okay, there are 100 points on the album. TLC had seven. Every point is equal to eight cents. All right? Seven times eight, 56 cents. But as time went on, we learned a lot. That means every time an album gets sold, TLC gets 56 cents. So 10 million records. $5.6 million. Seems like a lot of money. Well, it's not a lot of money when the record company has spent $3 million to record your album. And in the record business, we pay all costs back to the record company. We pay recording costs, video costs. So now we have $2.6 million left. Well, guess what? When you have that much money, you're in about the 47, 48.49% tax bracket. So that immediately gets deducted to $1.3 million. Then you split the rest three ways. You got about $300,000 a piece. Is that much? Okay? $300,000. I can buy a nice house with that. And what am I going to pay my bills with? So, I mean, put, put in, if you put, have the right deal. Yeah, if you have the right deal. And I guess this is something that left eye sort of woke us all up to that most mm -hmm. of us were shocked to hear um, when she yeah. said we've you know they're at the Grammys they've won all this stuff and they've sold 10 million and they said we're broke and it didn't make sense to any of us because we, you, right. you guys have sold all this stuff and she explained mm -hmm. about the advances and, 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 and how much you get and all that stuff and it was almost yeah. like wow put a big spotlight and then not long after you know um, Tony Braxton has to file for bankruptcy and it was like the Tony trend Braxton was... had made millions though. Tony was she had made she had made a lot of money, not what she deserved, but she had made a lot of money. So Tony's was a little bit different, and okay. even TLC had made a million a piece. So they made I think fifty six cents a, per girl or per record or something like that, and we made two pennies per record. What? Wow. Two cents per girl. Two cents for Cindy. Two cents for Maxine. Two cents for Dawn. Two cents for Terry. So this is an, a record that sells ten dollars. You get two cents out of the, from the ten dollars per record. Back then it was ten dollars, ten ninety nine for a record, and then it became uh, sixteen ninety nine, depending on the store. Yeah, and two pennies. So, but then I thought I I was under the impression that the a standard artist deal was twenty percent. Of every deal the, is different. That's not st there's no standard. This every deal is different for each artist. So it depends on how much you come in knowing and what your people represent for you. So okay. if your attorney is really good and he's in your corner and has your back, he's going to make sure you get a bigger point point um, structure. Yeah. He's going to make sure your percentages are larger. And that's yeah. what happened with um, Destiny's Child. They made millions of dollars because their deal was right. Yeah. <clears throat> you started talking about the industry in a way that you were the first, I think, to talk about the way artists right. were treated and to reclaim sort of the art by the artist. Since then, you know, around the late 90s, we saw the establishment of the, the Artist Coalition, for instance, all this dialogue taking place. Did you feel you were alone back then? And did you feel you had something to do with this dialogue taking place now amongst these artists? Well, uh, actually, when I would sit down with artists just hanging out, you know, chilling, not doing anything uh, in particular, we would talk about the trials and tribulations of the industry all the time. And we would talk about it. Um, ways that we could change things if we had our way. Uh, unfortunately, all of us were assigned to these really restrictive agreements where you can't get out of them until you deliver X amount of product. And that product would actually belong to the corporation that you're recording for. Now, the reason why it became such a big deal back then is ever since my third album, uh, I wasn't really taking large advances from the recording companies. I was recording the albums myself in my own studio. So the way I looked at it, I owned the work because I paid for it. And I did all the work, I created it, so I felt like it should belong to me. That said, the um, companies felt otherwise. And they would always hold this contract up and say, well, you signed it. And I say, well, I understand that. It's not like I want to leave. I just want to, you know, talk about this thing and see if we can't make it more fair. Of course, they wouldn't change because if they changed, they wouldn't really exist. 
And that's kind of the situation we're in right today. They're not going to exist. The question I had about, because one of the things I noticed recently when we, especially when we, even if we're on social media and, and you play a clip more than 30 seconds, you know, Instagram or Facebook will say this music is owned by Warner Brothers, Sony, um, you know, Universal. And even an artist can't even play their own stuff that they write for a period of time because the label seems to have ownership of it. And when you look back at when you guys wrote your own stuff and you had your hit, and then I, you, know, you hear about Prince and Michael Jackson, now even Kanye talking about the more successful they became, the more they start realizing we've made all this money, but we don't seem to have a bigger ownership of the stuff that we've created. Did that? Did you f sense that for as as when you guys came out and you were having this hit that we, we were writing all the stuff and creating it, but somebody else has a bigger ownership of this in the long run? Forget about now, but ten years, twenty years down the road, they will take it a away. Did, did did that part of come to come to your knowledge? Yeah, you know it was weird. It's really weird when your creativity. Um, something that you created, somebody like on the rights, but I guess that's what comes with being in the music business here is, man, it's, it's all about like, you gotta trade off something, man. So that's again why I say this era is a great era where, you know, you can retain your own masters and you can have your own music and it's yours. So that's one of the things why I say that the independent era is a great era. Um, you to own your own, own have ownership of your own songs. But back then, you know, when you, when you when you were signed to these labels and stuff like that, it just came with the program, man. That's just how it was. So you see a lot of artists who recently have um, got their masters back, like Chris Brown and a few other people. They bought their masters back. Wow. Um, you know, you see it happening now. Um, so and, and and it's just you know part of the game man yeah yeah but then did we do because it seems if you know after, you know you had the fateful up uh, night of meeting Joe Levert and and things just took off like that did it happen so quick that you didn't did you guys know about the publishings about royalties about all this stuff prior to getting signed so that you knew because we you know we've watched the new edition story little TLC talking about we were selling millions of albums, but we didn't get any money because they didn't really understand about being signed to a production company who takes all the money and stuff. Did you guys know about that early on? So that at least you knew what was coming in and you were assigned to the business part of things. Yeah, we learned because our lawyer explained it to us. Okay. And, uh, at the time we were listening, I'm like, wow, so this is how it go. And like, yeah, hey, you get an opportunity. So, you know, you get a standard first time artist contract and you find out that you that those are the ins and outs of the game. So we we were very aware, you know, um, of what of what the situation presented as far as the publishing and the masters on being owned by the label and you know, um, percentages going to management and to the production and all that, man. So it was it was no, it's an eye-opening experience. I tell you that. You know? <laughs> was it hard knowing this, knowing that a record sells and you, it's going to sell for ten dollars, and you probably get less than you know fifty cents or something like that? Did you know? Did it was it hard performing and and the numbers coming in and knowing that man, our, at the end of the day, our paychecks are not going to mirror up to the fact we've got a number one record, or did you guys just? got caught up in the success and the fame that the money part didn't really think come until later. Um, everything and how it went and, you know, because I was a student of the game, you know, I did a lot of studying into the music business and seeing stories about other artists before making it and um, a lot of those stories were new additions a lot of people didn't know about, but as time went you hear you know, rumblings and ramblings of, you know, artists being disgruntled or whatever, but we never were like that artist, to be honest. I wasn't anyway. Mm. Um, maybe a couple of the other guys, you know, they, they felt that way, but I wasn't one of the ones. You know, I was happy to be just doing what I'm doing and being able to be given the opportunity. And I'm um, just learning about the business as you're going and in the business. 
just looking to the future and, you know, looking forward to owning my own stuff and, you know, being able to, you know, have more of a tail code on my own material. Yeah. yeah. But then, so you, you, you guys then sort of click the... Do they just come out with contracts that sign here? And now, because and and the reason I ask this is that <laughs> I, you know, I've been over the past four or five months speaking to artists, and it, yeah. it's almost the same stories that you know we we saw in the TLC documentary, saw in the new edition and Bobby Brown stuff, and and it's almost almost like eye opening to us. Um, but for you guys at the time, it was like wow, we're just excited, we got an opportunity sign yes. here do, do we able to get lawyers and parents to look through and like what's going on or well you know with, with a contract that big it's like 24 <laughs> pages your parent my parents wouldn't have known exactly what was going on they looked at it <laughs> but they weren't in the music business none of our family members could ever tell us exactly what we were getting into mm. they had no clue it was nothing they'd ever seen before we had never seen it before so let alone our family members helping us through that well, we did go to Los Angeles. We got an attorney of our own. Uh, we hired Don Wilson, who was a black attorney. Um, a lot of times what happens with the, the attorneys that have a name in the industry, they're already tied and connected to the major labels. They're bought and sold by the majors. In other words, the, the attorneys know that they can't make an alliance with the artists that they're representing because they're gonna bring another artist through those doors. Mm. So in other words, um, they can't go against Clive Davis because for the artists that they're representing, because they know that they're going to bring another artist to Clive Davis and they have to make alliance with Clive. So they represent Clive or Jimmy Iovine or Sylvia Rohn in our case. Um, and he wasn't really looking out for in vogue as much. He told us some things were wrong uh, with the contract, but his loyalty was more with the industry. So we really didn't have somebody that had our backs from the very beginning. Um, and had we had someone that was not an attorney, an entertainment attorney that was not connected to the industry, we would have fared a lot better. Um, and it's also that we had uh, our producers, Denzel Foster, Thomas McElroy, had um, a manager named David Lombard. And they said to us, you guys should have him as your manager as well. Hmm. And they were like, it's a conflict of interest, but, you know, he's a good guy and he'll take care of you. And I was thinking, OK, well, if you guys say he's good, then he's good. And we all trusted that. But it was really a bad situation because when you when it comes time to renegotiate, if you're lucky enough to sell your first album goes multi platinum or platinum and you tear up that old contract, you have to renegotiate for better terms mm -hmm. than what you initially started with. Yeah. And. David was not willing to represent either side. He couldn't represent Danny and Tommy or us. So there was no one there in our corner. So, and I think we had, I, to, we had to, I'm sorry, we had to go ahead and, and um, hire another attorney to represent that renegotiation. It's like, by then it's like, well, why are we rehiring David back? Yeah. You know? And I think this is, this is sort of a lesson for, for, for upcoming, um, because it's, Artists. yeah, because it's quite easy to, You've been given a, a, a golden opportunity from nothing, and yes. they're saying half of nothing is nothing. But if they say, "Look, we've got five dollars, we can share it into five, it's like, "Well, I didn't have anything in the first place." So it's right, quite exactly. easy to take advantage of very vulnerable people, and it is quite a. It's well, it's it's, it's yeah. from the outside, it might seem easy, but I, 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 I can imagine that it's it's not. It's it was pressured. It was a lot of people you might yeah. trust in, in the early, early days i wouldn't say that so much it's like look you are looking at a situation where your dream has come true yeah you're in the industry the world is getting ready to hear your name for the first time like you just said um there's a great opportunity here when you first start out there is no reason for the record label it's not going to take a chance and put a whole bunch of money into you because they don't know if you're willing to sell if you're able yeah. to sell or not yeah they have no idea if you're gonna if if they throw you against the wall and you stick and the and the world loves you and you blow up, maybe that'll happen, but you might they might throw you against the wall and you don't work at all. Yeah. And the, you don't sell and the world doesn't pick up on the fact that you are successful and they love your music. So they were taking a huge chance on us and they were not willing to put up a bunch of money in order to do that. They had to make sure that we were we had no leverage. Yeah. You know what I mean? We had no um yeah. bargaining power. We had yeah. no um 
nothing to say, hey, we've done this and so we need more money. It's like we took what we were given because I had never made $10,000 at one time. And yeah. Cindy had never made that, Maxine, Terry. So they gave us $5,000 up front. I was working, literally, I was working at a dental office. I was probably making, I don't know, minimum wage back then, six bucks an hour. Mm. Did, did you then find out, was it because of your management company or yes. that? Yes, That I was blacklisted or that everything else went spiraling out of control was because of my management Because they took you from Epic and they then they were responsible for, for, for Virgin. But they were also responsible for stealing from me, stealing my publishing, stealing, you know, my, uh, you know, they would take, they would, also I'll go on tape saying they stole from me. Wow. Uh, um, and I made a lot of money, millions, millions. Especially and with, with, yeah, a with, portion, with, yeah. A good portion they stole. And they stole my publishing and I didn't know it. And I was angry for years. And this is how I found out. Uh, well, first of all, in the beginning, before, before I left my management company, I walked into one of my manager's offices and my business bank book, checkbook was on her desk, open which was unusual because I wasn't there to discuss any banking information and there was no reason for my checkbook to be out. And I happened to look at the ledger and it said, Andre's rent, Andre's rent, Andre's rent, Andre's rent, Andre's rent, who was my cousin, Andre's rent, Andre's rent, who I was paying for months, the whole entire time that, cause he had an apartment at the same building that we were living in and I was paying his rent and I didn't know it. So I was like, well, why am I paying, why all these checks for Andre? his rent and I'm paying him who and then who decided that they were going to and this, her response was you had no business looking on my desk <laughs> I was like but that's my checkbook woman <laughs> and huh. that just that led to the beginning of it's just it's just not going to work and, the, and you know they were like we made you and you're going to be nothing without us I was like listen you clearly have gotten it wrong my parents made me and I had a gift before I came to you that had nothing to do with you and it came from God. So you didn't make me and you didn't make me, you didn't create me, you didn't make me. Mm. And they were like, oh, it's over for you. And <laughs> uh, just, it's, I just thought it was funny that people think that they have the power to, you know, block something that God said was going to be. Yeah. Nobody has the power to do that. Yeah. And I always believed that you don't have the authority to stop God from working. And yeah. I trust him more than I trust you. Um, I made a lot of mistakes. I learned some hard, valuable lessons. Mm. Uh, I did end up, you know, leaving that company because I knew that I couldn't go further with them because I knew too much. Yeah. But I didn't know how much they had taken from me. So moving forward a few years, I get a call from some, or an email from some German producers who have gotten hold of some acapellas of mine. I don't know how they got them but they wanted to do some remixes and they wanted my blessing. And I gave them my blessing right away. Then afterwards, I began to look up to see what this meant, what, what it was going to mean to me for them to put out these songs, you know? And uh, during my research, I found out that I didn't own publishing to those songs. Not only had she taken my publishing, but she sold it. And then, then it had been sold again. It had been sold like three times. Um, someone owned it and that's what it was. So it didn't mean anything to me. And and I called Ted Courier because I thought he was in on it. I was like, Ted, man, I thought we was cool, man. He was like, what are you talking about? Well, I was just doing some research because yada, yada, yada. And I found out that I didn't own my publishing. And then he said, that's why I haven't gotten a check in the past 20 years. I was like, what are you talking about? What are you talking about? He said, I haven't gotten a publishing check for 20 years. And now that you're talking about this, I now know why, because it was his wife and she was taking his money too. He didn't know it. Mm. She's taking his money. She took his publishing and now she, and then they got divorced and she's off living well and, and getting a wow. check. Well, because I, I refuted all of that was going on. Um, those checks stopped. They stopped coming because they, uh, um, the publishing, uh, the publisher, or the administer of the, of the of the royalty checks froze them until we could clear up who actually owns them and all that kind of stuff. So they're still they're still um, in on hold, and hopefully soon that those funds will be released to their proper owner, which wow. is me. 
a good transition. The big thing that we we hear about with uh, with with music, it's, it's the it's the daily business of uh, contracts, publishing, writing, and all that stuff. Right. Um, you know, a lot of artists have struggled with that. You know, want getting into the business and enjoying the, the limelight and not realizing actually this is a business. How am I going to get paid? True. Did you guys sort of were you guys knowing what was happening? Like, if you're signing a contract, what you're signing and publishing and writing your own stuff, or what was it like for you guys? Well, we knew about the publishing in, in that situation, so we had some of that taken care of, but. We still had a, a small, with, within the group, we had a small situation where, you know, uh, one of the members in the group, well, we did, they were more friends with Gene than other. Some of us kept it real business. Some other were, you know, more friend, friendly with Gene. And at one point, some of the publish that we thought we had was signed over to another member in the group, which we was like, okay, how did that happen? And blah, blah, blah. But um, we went through that situation. Another situation was, when you're touring and you're on the road, this is what was told to us. Well, you know, you guys, you know, you're gonna make your money from touring and all that stuff. But when you're out on the road and checks come in, how are you gonna get your money? Mm. So you need to, you know, all your checks when they come through, just sign this paper and it'll be CO to, you know, Griffin Entertainment. CO means care of. So that means when the check come in, he can sign it. So if a check came in for 10,000, oh yeah, you had a check in for 2,000. Y'all split this up between the four of y'all. Mm. So. You know, some of that went on. <laughs> wow. You know, but at the time we really that part of the business we really didn't know. We just assumed that okay, we're on tour. I guess our our checks will go in and get stacked up because we never went on tour as a group. We yeah. went on as a backup band where every time we did a show, that following week we got our check. Yeah. Because as a backup band, we're just hired musicians. Yeah. You know, um, so we you know got our checks, but as an artist, it's totally different. You know, your incorporation, your, you know, incorporated and all that stuff, LLC. And so the checks went back here and then f telling us, hey, to, for y'all to get paid, you would have to do this. Okay, we just worry about our show. Yeah. You know, who we perform with. Let's make sure we better than them. We ain't worry about other junk. Let's just, they, that's what they do. We, they're paid to handle that, which back then we should have known, hey, we, we need to take care of our business. And so the four, the four of you really kind of w didn't know about this and you were just trusting everyone around you and stuff like that? Pretty much, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, it, it, it's, a, it's a sad story that every artist goes yeah. through, which I see how every artist go through it now, you know? Do you think it's better now? I, just, 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 just as a side note, do you think more artists are a lot more attuned or do you think they're still falling traps of what you guys fell in in, in the early days? Well, I, that's a two part answer. It's better because it's more independent artists. They have their mm -hmm. own thing. They can go out, do their own shows, make their own money, put yeah. their own t-shirts out. Like the t-shirts and stuff that we wear, we have a printing company we that we own. So we print all our t-shirts, all our merchandise. Okay. So we can handle everything on our own. But to really get to that next, next, next level, you, de you do need a lot of connections. You need that money behind you. You need that machine, which is a label. The label is gonna say, hey, this is what we can do. This is what we need from y'all. So it really is up to the artist to say, okay, I'm gonna take a hit, but I want to get to that next level. Okay. You know, but, you know, so it, ha it still happens to this day. Did you guys learn about the business that early? Cause then I think that's the one thing that uh, when I'm speaking, spoken to a lot of artists past and forth, they talk about the business early days. They didn't really know, they were just, they wanted their shot and they didn't realize. Did you learn about the publishing and the contracts and all that stuff? We learned about management. We learned, we learned about how, um, what management should be able to do and shouldn't be able to do. Like we didn't learn about, I didn't learn about publishing until way later when I had to defend myself in front of the label with Motown. But with, um, back then, with, all we knew was about the, we just knew we had paperwork with him and he was getting 20%. That's it, like that's all we understood about okay. the management paperwork. And we understood, we knew when the term was up. Like we knew how long we had in the contract. Like we, yeah. would, we would always know that type of stuff. Yeah, <laughs> okay. It was like, yeah, we always knew that about every manager. It's just when you start dealing with labels and they they uh, advising you with lawyers and stuff like that, you not, you really, they try to make you really feel like it's a family. Yeah. Not, you know what I mean? It's all business, but they sucker you in with the, with the family and the bros and the, I love yous and let's go out to eat and, you know what yeah. I mean? Like they don't tell you like that this coming out your budget. You know, yeah. you don't learn that stuff until they send you this 
thick booklet of yeah. what you sent. <laughs> yeah. You mentioned about the booklet. Did you guys know? Because as I said, it, I'm hearing stories all the time. Did you guys know? Okay, you, we, we'll give you twenty percent, and we, all this is going to be paid for. We're going to own everything that you do, and um, you have. Did you did you see the zero? <laughs> okay. No, but you know what? Uh, we 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 kind of knew that first of all going into the deal because we wasn't. We already knew we didn't have a publishing deal with them. So we knew like, and then the first five songs that we got were from Joe. Like they sent us music before we even started recording. Like before we even wow. left to go to New York, we had songs from us, for us uh, from Joe. Mm -hmm. So we had to learn these songs because this we was gonna record. It wasn't none of our stuff. So we knew like, they gonna own this. Like we not gonna own this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, but we wasn't real, like, again, we was, we just wanted to sing. Like we wasn't really thinking about the business at all. Like we was 17, 18, nah, yeah, 18, 19, 20. Yeah. We was just excited to be out of our, our known environment. Yeah. We was in New York now, you know what I mean? Like we in the studio with Joe. I just saw <laughs> his album, you know what I mean? Like I, I love this dude. Like, yeah, yeah. Like I, I learned so much from that dude, but it's like that, I, we was all like mind blown. You gotta understand, man, we from Shreveport, Louisiana. <laughs> <laughs> the furthest, the furthest my group members have been was like Atlanta. Yeah, <laughs> in the field. But they ain't been outside the South like that. Yeah. So for us to move from here and go to New York, man, no. What? What you eating? Couscous? Yeah. No, I'm not doing that. <laughs> like you know, like it, it was a total culture shock for us. Yeah. So, but and it was a learning experience, like. We coming from the south people like why y'all talking like this you know what i mean like, <laughs> <laughs> so it, it, it was weird you know what i mean i felt like i was in school again yeah. how long did that last for it lasts up until we started probably like the second album that's when we started um seeing weird stuff like weird money stuff happening like okay okay money coming up missing and it's like we know where it's going bro like you stealing so now we gotta let you go like come on man we don't want to do this yeah but we you stealing from us like we gotta stop it like we can't keep letting it go on and we we ain't have good advisors around us yeah did you guys were you learning about the business side the publishing side and all that stuff at this stuff yes yes yeah during that time like we we understood like when we, when we found out because they was talking about man we were just gonna put y'all in the studio and let y'all produce some records like yeah we yeah, we have some songs that we own. They are like, nah, we don't own half. I was like, nah, no, y'all won't. We got, we don't have a publishing agreement. So we were standing in our office when we had that discussion. So they had to go, Kojo had to go look at our file and see if we had a publishing agreement. And he was like, nah, we don't. I was like, man, we didn't sign that. We just signed a record deal. That was one of those uncomfortable conversations that we had to have with not just the group, but with us and the president of the label. Cause you, cause you mentioned yeah, cause I didn't want to do a third album. I didn't want to do a third album. Yeah, they wasn't gonna pay us for a third album. They were just gonna give us a, a a recording budget, and then you never know what that budget was gonna entail. You don't know what the marketing budget was gonna be with them. Cause you're not gonna get more money if you're not selling more records. So all the money was gonna go down. So to me, logically, it didn't make sense for me to stay in like a slave deal just to say I got a deal. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's very interesting that you're saying this because, you know, Prince was one of the biggest ones to first talk about being a slave to Warner Brothers. Then mm -hmm. around 2002, Michael Jackson says Sony, the same sort of thing, because they went from his album and they own it, they, you know, they, they disagreement. And now we start to see a lot of other people say, you know, Jaheem stopped recording because he's like, look, I'm, I own that, I create all this stuff and you guys own it. And you can, I think even yeah. you had Neil talk about it. Um, they wanted him to sound like someone else and they shelved his album and didn't release it. Yep. And so that's the balance that, that, that you have, especially within R&B and stuff. They don't really do yes. that to rap and hip hop as much, but they do it mainly with R&B. They really try and control. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, in, in, in most of the rapping stuff, most of the rappers, I ain't gonna say all of them, but a lot of them, they write their own stuff. Mm -hmm. So it's like they have to negotiate a publishing deal with them. You know what I'm saying? Like, because you're not just, you're not just talking to somebody that's just hitting notes. All of these rappers, these are their thoughts. These are, they pen this. Mm -hmm. So you gotta get, they gotta get them a bag. They gotta get them a check. 
But with R&B people, most of these people just sing a song. You can do a cover song, you see what I'm saying? Like, and not get paid. You can put it out and all that. Mm-hmm. But you don't own that publishing, all you're gonna do is get shows off of it. So, and man, I say any corporation is about manipulation with its people. So if they can manipulate you with that money, they will. Yeah. So, yeah. Just, just be mindful of the deal that you get into. I tell anybody that. And our, our deals weren't bad, they were they was standard. Standard, yeah. A lot of the group, you know, it only happens with the black groups and the black acts that we are ripped off this way. It doesn't happen with the country Western artists, like the Garth Brooks of the world or, um, you know, NSYNC, I think NSYNC went through something uh, with Justin Timberlake yeah. in the group. But uh, for the most part, white artists don't go through the same thing. So I'm just wondering why we are the ones who get, you know, faltered this way. La- labels over here, especially R and B labels, they uh, they like you, so they they can control young young artists. Yeah. But they figure once you get up in age, they're like, oh, he will want to read the contract, and <laughs> he's gonna be questioned. And that's why that's why a lot of R and B uh, artists come out, you know, young. But if you look at the pop artists over here, you they come out 40, 50, some sixty years old, and they got you know. They got a pop artist coming out. But R and B uh labels want to control you, so that's why they get young artists. Yeah. And that you know, they'll tell you you too old to come out and mm. but young artists just want a video and a and a and a flashy car. Yeah. And you know, they won't ask for nothing else. And and that's the reason why they won't get a um, more uh advanced or uh, in age artist that because they figure they're gonna they're gonna know the business and they're gonna start asking questions. Yeah. But, yeah, there's a lot of talent in uh, over here that that got age on them, but R and B is won't touch. It. Well, I mean, you know, Charlie Wilson still has a recognizable voice. You know, um, let me just say this: the tradition, the tradition of great performers from. And, and I really want you to hear what I have to say. The tradition of great performers from Sammy Davis Jr. to James Brown to Jackie Wilson to Fred Astaire, Gene Kelly. The story is usually the same though. You know, these guys work really hard at their craft, but the story ends the same. They usually are broken, torn, and usually just sad. And the story is very sad in the end. Because the companies take advantage of them. They really do. And um, um, Sony... (laughs) Sony... Be, being, um, you know, being the artist that I am um, at Sony, I, I've, I've generated several billion dollars for Sony, several billion, and um, they, they really thought that my mind is always on music and dancing, and, and, I, and it usually is, but they never thought that this performer myself would outthink them. Yeah. So um, we can't let them get away with, the, with what they're trying to do because now I'm a free agent. Yeah. I'm, I, um, I just owe Sony one more album. It's just a box set, really. And so um, with two new songs, which I've written ages ago. <laughs> Because every album that I record, I write, like, literally, I'm telling you the truth, I write, I write at least um, 120 songs every album I do. So, 
I can do the box set and just give them any two songs. So, so I'm leaving Sony a free agent. Um, Owning half of Sony. So, I own half of Sony's publishing in, and I'm leaving them, and they, they're very angry at me because of it, but um, I just, I just did good business, you know? Because I, I, I didn't notice, um, the, yeah, the, the change of the sales, but also the, the sort of promotion. And, and I guess, and I think Michael touched on this, you know, about how when he came out with his last Invisible album, how he felt Sony wasn't pushing. And for those of us on the outside, we don't understand, but you're saying right. that it makes a difference how they take the project and push it and stuff. Yeah, because uh, record companies' relationship with radio, television is massive. And what they choose to promote and market makes a difference. What they take as a priority, and they go to radio and say, okay, oh, Sheila, this is our number one priority. Mm -hmm. We want this record, and we want to be hard on this record, whatever we got to do to make this, and then they'll make sure that you're getting a radio promotion, but you got to have a key guy that knows how to market yeah. and promote. That was zero buzz before us. Wow. Well, well, same situation with Michael Jackson. Uh, when his relationship with Sony, I guess, was getting a little shaky, yeah, uh, you could tell the promotion and marketing was not where it could have, should have been. Yeah. And he felt that. He knew because he understands the business. He knows when the record company pushes that button about yeah. let's make this record heard. Whether it's a hit or not is one thing, but when a record company knows we got to make this record heard, we got to make this record seen, this video, they know how to promote it. And if you lose that key person at that record label, you're yeah. going to feel the difference. Hmm. That's the reality of the music business. Mm.